Lakeland PBS, the Bemidji Pioneer, the Brainerd Dispatch, and Northern Community Radio are proud to present Debate Night 2020, a look at our area legislative candidates. And now, the Senate District 2 debate. Your moderator tonight is Bethany Wesley. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Debate 2020. I'm Bethany Wesley. This debate, featuring the candidates seeking to represent Senate District 2, is the continuation of our first night of state legislative debates. This week, Lakeland PBS will air 10 state legislative debates over four nights of television. I'm coming to you tonight from our Lakeland PBS studio in Bemidji, but our candidates and our panelists are joining us remotely due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We appreciate that they and you are still joining us this evening. The candidates seeking to represent Senate District 2 are Senator Paul Utke from the Republican Party and Leonard Roy from the Democratic Farmer Labor Party. Our panelists are Matthew Lidke, Bemidji Pioneer reporter, Heidi Holton, Public Affairs Director for Northern Community Radio, KAXE and KBXE, and Dennis Wyman, Lakeland PBS News Director. Now, the rules for tonight's debate. Each candidate will get three minutes for his opening statement. Our candidates will then answer questions from our panelists. Some of these questions will be of the panelists' own choosing. Others may come from the public. The order of the candidates' responses will be rotated, beginning with the opening statement and finishing with their closing comments. Each candidate will have two minutes for each question. Each candidate will have the opportunity for a one-minute rebuttal. Tonight, our candidates will also have the option of a one minute bonus time to add on to one of their answers. This can be used during the answer to the initial question or during the rebuttal, but it can only be used once. Questions will continue until we are at about 50 minutes into the debate, at which time we will move on to closing comments. Closing comments will be two minutes each. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Opening the debate tonight will be Senator Paul Utke. Paul, your opening statement. Thank you, Bethany, and thank you to all who are participating here. Um, again, my name is Paul Etke, and I will do a little introduction for the starting. Um, I have the honor of representing all of you in Senate District 2 in St. Paul uh, over the past four years. I'm asking for your support and your vote again this year. And a little about my family and background. Uh, my wife, Nancy, and I have two adult daughters, one living in Fargo and one in Nashville, Tennessee. We have lived in the Park Rapids area, actually in Park Rapids for the past 27 and a half years. Um, my working career started with 15 years of working for Mack truck dealers. We then owned and operated a retail hardware and equipment rental store in Park Rapids for 17 years. And in the past decade, I've co-mingled a couple occupations. I've been, I am a certified legal video specialist and have been for the last 13 years. I'm a licensed insurance agent for the past 10 years and I man, own and manage uh, commercial rental property uh, here in town. During my time in the Minnesota Senate, I have served as vice chair of the Human Services Committee and also served on the Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee, the Jobs and Economic Growth Committee, and for two years on the E-12 Education Committee. I've also served four years on the Senate caucuses as a Senate caucuses representative um, on the state's worker compensation advisory council. And most recently I've been appointed as vice chair of the National Council of Insurance Legislators Workers Compensation Committee vice chair. This is a 50 state organization that works on all insurance related issues and rates model laws for our state legislatures to consider. Before serving in the Senate, I served seven years on the Park Rapids City Council. Plus I have served as chairman and president of numerous local organizations and a multi-state organization. My varied background has been an asset in St. Paul as we discuss and act on many different forms of legislation. Um, with that, I look forward to whatever questions the panel might have for us this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Leonard, your opening statement. Well, thank you all for uh, having me on here this evening. And uh, I do want to thank you guys for um, doing this over Zoom due to the pandemic. I know it's incredibly important that we keep our families safe and our staff as well. A little bit about my background. My name is Leonard Allen Roy. I do go by Allen. It's my middle name. 
and I'm born and raised in the area. I um, went to school in Detroit Lakes, graduated there, and after that, I went off to college at the University of Minnesota, where I graduated in 2006. After graduating out of college, I joined the Army and commissioned as an officer, and shortly thereafter, I deployed to Operation Iraqi Freedom, where I spent a year overseas. I had a, I was an infantry officer, uh, so I um, did a lot of uh, air assault missions uh, over in Iraq. Um, upon leaving active duty, I came back stateside, uh, raising my family. I got three kids, and um, I've spent uh, the past few years um, using my GI Bill to go back to school. I got my undergrad, added to my undergraduate degree, and then in 2018, I received a master's in public affairs from the Humphrey School. Right around that time in 2018, I was elected to the White Earth Tribal Council, where I currently serve as the secretary treasurer. I still serve in the Army Reserves as an officer as well. I, um, I also serve on the Tribal Executive Committee for the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe. I am responsible for about a $200 million budget for the organization. And I've done a lot of work. I've done some work with the Senator here, Senator Paul Adkey, and some of the local legislators. I've also done work with the White House. I've done work with Congress. I've done work with um, municipalities, county, uh, county officials as well. So I do have a wealth of experience that I've gained over the past few years. Um, I'm running because I wanna improve uh, the lives of everyone that lives here in Senate District 2 and in Minnesota. I do wanna make sure that um, we are providing uh, quality education. We are rebuilding the economy because of the pandemic. And I also wanna make sure that we're providing quality healthcare that is affordable and accessible for everyone that lives here. And I do wanna thank you guys for your time. Thank you and miigwech. Thank you for that. Our first question will come from Matthew and then the first response will then come from Alan. Thanks both of you for being here tonight. I wanted to start by asking about um, the response to the pandemic in the years to come. Uh, this year, we've seen a lot of relief efforts, both coming from the government and from local organizations and, and committees and such uh, to help small businesses uh, kind of weather the storm right now. Uh, what do you feel the legislature's role will be in 2021 uh, to continue as business, uh, continue supporting businesses as reopenings happen and, and life um, looks to return, return to normal in the future? Well, thank you for that question, uh, Matt. Well, first, um, when this pandemic first broke out, this virus, we didn't know much about it. However, over a period of time, we've learned a lot more. And so um, a lot of our small businesses, and I talk to folks every day, every day over the phone, talk to small businesses, and they're telling me that a lot of folks have gotten laid off. A lot of small, a lot of small businesses are shutting their doors. A lot of the small businesses that put in for some of these relief programs a lot of that money was gobbled up in a very quick and short amount of time. And so the role of the legislature is to make sure that we're here in the small business community and that we're bringing those voices to the legislature. And if that means that we need to be advocating for more small business grants uh, for those uh, businesses that have been directly affected by the pandemic, that's certainly something that we need to do. Now, in my role as secretary treasurer with the tribe, certainly we've spoken with our federal partners. We've advocated for um, them to ensure that there's money available uh, for our uh, for our uh, business community, and that's something that we need to continue. We need to continue that work in the legislature. Um, I know that our response. Um, we've lost a lot of lives, you know, and prayers to all those families that have been affected by the pandemic. I know our president has been affected by the virus, and certainly he and the first lady and mill are. Uh, Millions of other Americans have been affected by this. And this is a terrible virus. And so I do want to send out my prayers to everyone that has been affected by it. Thank you. Thank you. Paul? You know, I think there, there's still a, a fair amount of unknowns of what the uh, legislature will be uh, involved in. But, you know, a big thing that I guess I've been and a lot of others um, as we're wading through this uh, since March, when things came to a uh, um, basically a quick halt um, throughout a state, and you know things gradually opened back up. Um, it's as you look at the pandemic, 
we've never closed down an economy before over something like this. So it's been a real eye opener. Um, we still, you know, we, we don't want to lose lives. That's the most important thing is protecting our people, protecting our um, elderly and protecting the most vulnerable. They, uh, of course, are getting hit the worst. Uh, but at the same time, getting this economy going again. Um, and then also at the legislative level, I know the conversation has been had and will come up again. Um, we're a big state and what we can do in rural Minnesota is different than maybe what they do in the heavily populated metro areas. Um, and we need to address all of those things because um, we need to move things forward. Um, we're going to be um, faced with additional needs uh, that our small businesses and our small communities uh, already have and will continue to have. Um, I believe it's only going to be um, worse as we get into the fall and winter because uh, throughout the summer when we do the uh, biggest share of our business in our small areas, we can so-called kick that can down the road. Cash flow is coming. Um, we're getting into a serious time of the year where we're going to have to figure out how um, how we can take care of them. Because we, you know, just like losing lives, uh, uh, these businesses are lives too. Um, and we need to do all we can there to help them. A lot of the monies that have been used so far have come from the federal government. Um, and of course, hopefully there's more of that. I mean, that's our money too, but yet, we know what the state is facing in a budget shortfall coming up. So it's, uh, it's gonna be a challenge, but uh, we'll make it through it. All right, thank you. Alan, do you have a rebuttal? I just, I agree with what the Senator said that we need to support our small business community. And that, that is the lifeblood of our state. Thank you. Paul? Nope, I'm fine. Okay, thank you. So our next question will come from Heidi and the first response will come from Paul. Thank you. Thanks for being here today. During this pandemic and the economic shutdown, we have learned about a lot of disparities that were always there but are now more apparent. We've learned who essential workers are. We've seen health care disparities when it comes to people of color and rural versus urban dis disparities. What's your responsibility as the next senator of District 2 to address these and how will you do it? Well, I think the, the, the biggest thing that comes along, at least the way I approach everything is, uh, you know, everybody is important. I mean, the fact that uh, we did label some essential and some non-essential in a way was kind of a slap to those that got <laughs> labeled with the unessential part of it, because um, in our country, in our state, in our district, I believe everybody is important and we need to take care of everybody there. We have seen though where this virus has been um, harder on some groups and it, you know, it has things to, you know, to do with uh, our activities, our health, our health care. Um, and maybe it's pointing out some weaknesses that, I mean, in four years, I've seen a lot of areas where we have had weaknesses and we've worked to help a lot of those out. But, uh, you know, this just brings more to the forefront and we will continue that mission. Um, actually, as vice chair of the Human Services Committee, we deal with human related issues constantly. Um, we aren't totally into the health care, but we're into the needs of people from uh, basically birth to death. Um, and so we see all of it and know that we have got, um, you know, like I say, we had a lot of issues and now we've got more things to, to work on. And uh, um, sometimes something that's bad brings out some good. And in this case, um, you know, we're gonna be more pointed on where we need to go and uh, what we need to do to make sure that we don't put people in a bad circumstance. But uh, um, again, back to the essential versus uh, not essential. I think we're all essential and everybody in our area is essential. And that's the way I'd like to approach it. Thank you, Paul. Alan? Well, that's a great question. Thank you for asking it, Heidi. When it comes to disparities in Minnesota, we do suffer a lot of economic, social, and healthcare disparities that need to be addressed at some point. I know that we've, we've had a lot of folks that have been working on this issue for a number of years. And I can tell you as a Native American, somebody that was born and raised on the White Earth Reservation, I have a lot of relatives and friends and family members that have 
that I've seen the, these disparities firsthand. We also know that the pandemic has disproportionately affected communities of color all across the state of Minnesota, and it's not acceptable. What I think we can do as a senator if, if I were to be elected, I think that what we need to do is work more collaboratively with some of these communities that have, um, have a voice and to bring them to the table. And what I mean by that is one thing the Army taught me is we, we, none of us work in a vacuum, all right? So we have tribal governments all across the state of Minnesota. We have um, you know, nonprofits all across the state of Minnesota. What we need to do is we need to come together and have a conversation of how we can better streamline these resources, these services, and with the healthcare professionals as well, those experts as well, on how we can better address these issues when it comes to healthcare disparities. The responsibility is everyone's, right? Even down to the individual um, person that, that's having healthcare issues, but it always it goes all the way up to the governor and everyone in between. And so um, the way I would address that is by coming together, consulting with those folks and, and finding out what the right answer is going to be, because what we have right now is not working. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Alan. Paul, do you have a rebuttal? I will just add that, you know, in the, just the four years I've been uh, at the state Senate, we have met, we have worked with and had uh, meetings and hearings with people of all walks of life. Um, and I think those have been good. They've been productive. And, you know, we just ran into something here that's uh, an exception. We haven't had a pan pandemic like this since the early uh, 1900s, over 100 years ago. So um, unfortunately, people, it's, it's, there's a little bit of a learning curve, but I think the communications have been good and will continue to be that way. So thank you. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Alan? Well, just want to re-echo the fact that, uh, that um, People, people want results. And, um, you know, with my military background, I'm results focused, and I will bring that leadership to the Senate. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question will come from Dennis and Alan, you'll have the first response. Okay, thanks both of you for joining us tonight. Um, for the first time in 12 years, the Minnesota Senate voted to remove a Minnesota cabinet member. In fact, the Senate voted to remove two cabinet members, first Department of Labor and Industry Commissioner Nancy Lepink, and then later Commerce Commissioner Steve Kelly. The governor has criticized the moves as being petty and, and a response to him continuing to hold emergency powers. Senate Majority Leader Paul Gazelka says the moves were in the works before the pandemic. Were the, obviously, Senator Utke, you voted for that. Uh, I'd like to hear your reasoning behind that. And then also, um, Alan, if you could give us your thoughts on if that was warranted. And Alan, you're first. That's a great question. Thank you for it, Dennis. Um, I had this question about three weeks ago and none of us work in a vacuum. The governor, the legislature, um, health professionals, we're all meant to work together for, for, the, for the people, right? And that's why they put us in these places. And so um, do I think it's right that we're removing people um, because of the emergency powers? I don't know if that's the right answer, but what I also don't know what is the right answer is if the governor is not consulting with the legislature. We need to be talking, all right? Effective leadership is one where an executive or a senator or anyone else for that matter sits down at the table, we talk through our problems, we come up with a solution. There are millions of lives at stake. Now is not the time to, have, to be playing partisan politics. We need to come together. We need the proper leadership. We need to make sure that we're working towards meaningful outcomes. Um, when it comes to uh, the, uh, the emergency powers, you know, we've learned a lot more about this virus than we did before. And is it time that we need to reassess and, and take another look at reopening the state? I would say that's a possibility. I think we need to start having that conversation. You can only do this for so long. Thank you. Thank you. Paul. Thank you. And uh, I'll just start off with, uh, yes, I did vote in both, both times to uh, uh, not confirm the commissioners. And, but we spent a lot of time 
working on this. And actually, as you, you did, you started out by mentioning, I believe, I don't remember who did, but uh, our Senate Majority Leader had talked about the fact of these removals. And if we listen to what was said there and what we worked on over the last great number of months, um, our leadership went to the governor back in February um, and talked to the governor about both of these commissioners saying that in our eyes, they just weren't doing their job uh, up to the expectations um, that we had. And, you know, the Senate is charged with the responsibility of even a, either approving or not approving these commissioners that the governor has uh, appointed. It's kind of the checks and balances. Um, with the first meeting, and actually there were a number of meetings thereafter, we had um, suggested that, you know, the governor could make some internal moves and hopefully, um, you know, come up with somebody different, but yet uh, give these people a, a good job. And, but uh, in the end, there was no movement. Um, and our only option at that point was, because we based it strictly on job performance. Uh, people will talk a lot about politics and the fact that we're against these uh, emergency orders and the peacetime emergency and all this. Um, that is true, but uh, um, we didn't just pull two names out of a hat. Uh, they were based on strictly job performance. Um, and, you know, we, I could go into a list there, but uh, we're not going to have time. So we'll just say it was based on facts. And yes, we don't want to uh, cut somebody's career short, but uh, at this point, it was our responsibility to, uh, to do something. And this is the, what we did. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. Alan, a rebuttal? Well, I would just say that um, effective leadership is one that sits down even with those that they disagree with and we can come up with a common solution. And so it'd be nice to see that sort of leadership in the Senate and with the governor's office. Thank you. Thank you. Paul? You know, that's uh, just add it. Um, we would like to have that type of uh, uh, communications with uh, the administration and the governor's office, but uh, unfortunately through this time, that has not been an option. Um, it's been frustrating um, to all of us, including our leadership who has to um, try to make those uh, communications work. Um, and it is a definitely a two-way street. I mean, it's uh, it goes both ways. So uh, we just hope it gets better in the future. All right, thank you. Our next question will come from Matthew and Paul, you'll have the first response. My question is focused on infrastructure, specifically water infrastructure. Uh, Bemidji is looking at two projects um, within the city regarding water. Um, and many of these projects um, are in response to state um, rules and, and limits and such that are requiring changes. Um, resulting in these projects. Um, does the legislature then have to look and, and, and consider what the future is over the next um, several years regarding water infrastructure in the state um, with um, M MNPCA rules changing and, and new standards being established? Um, can you talk about what the legislature has to do here moving forward regarding uh, water infrastructure? Sure. I believe the, uh, and, and have supported this uh, with some of our um, bills and conversations already in the fact that, uh, you know, when the PCA comes out and changes these um, numbers at the uh, different cities, um, and in this case, you brought up Bemidji, I know in the area, um, there's been other um, cities throughout the district that have run into the same thing. Um, PCA moves the, uh, basically moves the needle. Um, I feel as a legislature, we are gonna have to step in and, uh, and help out because we just can't keep doing this. Uh, the numbers are huge. We know what the numbers for the uh, Bemidji project are, it's staggering. Um, and if that's just dropped on the backs of, of the taxpayers there, um, you know, we've had it in Detroit Lakes, um, a similar thing with their wastewater discharge. Um, yeah, City of Monoman's got a water project going through that, that we need, to, we've been trying to help with. And, you know, some of those new rules, I believe, have gone too far also. We need to find out 
um, and have somebody, the experts, I guess, tell us what really is a safe level if it's in the water. Uh, you know, they they move the needle so far in Bemidji that from what I've been told, um, you basically can't even detect um, how minor it is, um, but yet they're making them go to such a, a low level. <clears throat> and, you know, that's, we, all, we have limited resources, whether it's at our city level or county level or our state level, um, you know, first would be the safety of our people and having good drinking water, but then to make sure we're doing it correctly. And as long as the PCA is changing the rules, um, the state's gonna have to be involved. Thank you, Paul. Alan? Well, that's a great question, Matthew. Our water infrastructure is an incredibly important issue that affects our folks in Bemidji and all across Minnesota. I would add that, um, you know, as Paul had said, or the Senator had said is, Everyone wants to have clean drinking water. Everyone wants to make sure that they themselves and their family and their children are drinking you know, good water and that there's um, the water is being taken care of. The infrastructure piece, um, I would add is, you know, when, if, if or when these projects are approved, these are uh, almost like an economic stimulus to the local economy and the state economy. Um, these do create jobs when folks go to work on these projects. Um, so, you know, if we're in a, a COVID pandemic and the economy is down, and if we need to green light some of these projects to get the economy jump started again, then that's something we need to take a look at. Um, as far as the MTCA um, changing its rules and regulations, we do have to take a look at um, who are the experts and who's providing this advice. And um, if they're providing sound advice, then that's something that we need to, we need to definitely heed that advice. Um, there's a lot of sulfate levels uh, in the waters uh, throughout Minnesota, um, and, and those do affect our, our lakes, our streams, they do affect our environment, and we want to make sure that we're, we're making sure that we're taking care of those things. Um, he also mentioned that uh, we do have a number of projects that are water-related infrastructure, such as Monoman um, and other areas in the Senate District. Uh, these projects are really important, especially for rural Minnesota, uh, because not too often do we uh, get these sort of investments. And so um, in bottom line, I'd just like to, I, honestly, I would like to have a conversation with the city council, with the county commissioners and see what they think. Um, obviously they've been, I know Monoman has been advocating for uh, their water infrastructure project um, because uh, they've, they've brought it to the White Earth Tribal Council and we've advocated for it down at the legislature. And so um, if the local officials are saying they need it, and that's something that I'm gonna support. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Leonard. Uh, Paul, a rebuttal. Um, all I would say is it, both of the projects, uh, actually two out of the three, because the Detroit Lakes one was is completed, but uh, um, the Bemidji project and the Monoman project are in the current bonding bill. So we will um, see when that gets moved through. Um, but, uh, that shows the importance. In fact, they've been heavily involved with the, Mon <coughs> excuse me, the Monoman project because uh, um, their circumstances, they're controlled by the federal government too, that's put them in a rough spot um, to be able to get uh, different grants and such. So um, we've moved them to uh, basically the top of our list. It's an important project in a small community and, and they need it. So um, that's about all I've got. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Alan, a rebuttal? Just very quickly, I know the bonded bill, um, it's, these things might be in the bonded bill, but we've yet to pass one. And so um, hopefully uh, I'm results focused. That's all I'll say. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question will come from Heidi and Alan, you'll have the first response. So this question has to do with disinformation. It's a concern in our world right now, especially when it comes to COVID-19 and to the election. Media by some people is viewed as unreliable. What sources do you trust? And has there been any misrepresentation of you and your campaign that you would like to tell the people about people living in your district? Well, thank you for the question, Heidi we want to make sure that the truth is getting out there and we want to make sure that people are provided accurate factual information when they form their opinions when they uh, decide how they're going to uh, vote how they're going to send their children to school 
um, whether it's related to the election or whether it's related to the pandemic. Um, truth and reporting is really important. And I say that because, you know, I went to school as part of my undergrad. I have a uh, uh, journalism as a major to my undergraduate degree. So I understand the importance of ethics and journalism. I understand um, um, what, what they call is uh, what they're calling now fake news, right? Um, I, I understand these things. Um, but we all have a responsibility, all of us, each of us on this video and at home, those folks watching at home to fact check our, our sources. This is an individual responsibility. Um, this is the way our, our, our constitutional republic was formed as we are to make sure that we're an informed electorate. Um, when we're looking at uh, news media sources, I watch all the news. I watch them all. So I watch Fox News, I watch CNN, I watch, um, I, I read uh, NPR, I read the New York Times. I look at all sorts of information so I can make sure that I'm making my own opinion. And that's something that we need to advocate for those folks at home. And so we're not just seeing one side of the story. Um, as far as misrepresentations go out there, um, I think uh, I think the Republicans have left me alone for the most part, and so I feel I feel pretty good about that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I just think we all have a responsibility, and especially the news media, uh, they have a responsibility to make sure that factual information is getting out there. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Paul. You know, I, I uh, like. Uh, Alan, I take I, I read a lot, uh, take and listen to a lot of different news, <clears throat> and I do think that's our personal uh, responsibility as we uh, do gather from all these sources. Uh, we hear a lot of things, and then it's up to us to investigate um, and to make sure that we what we're hearing or reading isn't just a soundbite. That we know exactly either what that person said or what they meant, and um, and I think we miss out on a lot of that nowadays because. I don't know if it's because we have so many different sources, we only catch little bits and pieces as we go around, but um, it's it's our responsibility to be an educated voter when we actually go in the voting booth and uh, select a candidate. Um, you know, locally, um, it, it's been great this go around. I haven't seen anything negative in our district. Um, in fact, I think some of it's just really getting going and, but I, I expect it to be, um, all cordial and uh, above board and but you know we all watch what comes across on our TVs from our congressional district races to our Senate US Senate to our presidential and we see all the uh, I'll, I'll just call it trash that gets put out there um, you know it's not right you know in some cases it's an outright outright lie and it would be nice if that stuff wasn't out there um, let's have the candidates talk about what they stand for, what they can do, um, what kind of uh, person they are. And then you've got the outside money I wish would come in and do the same, um, build up their candidate of preference rather than tear down the other side. So campaign season can get ugly and that's the unfortunate side of it. A lot of money gets spent on that. And uh, um, you know, it's a, all, always our goal is someday that's gonna, start to diminish rather than to increase. So we'll hope that it gets better, but locally I expect it to be a, uh, uh, okay. a very cordial and uh, welcoming campaign. Thank you, Paul. Alan, a rebuttal? Well, all I, all I can say is uh, it's everyone's responsibility to make sure they're getting accurate information. And, you know, as far as uh, the local races are going, you know, I don't want to say something that's uh, too over the line because I, I may have to work with uh, the senator should he be reelected, and so I'm, I, I like I realize that you know that's one thing I've learned in politics is like you, there's some lines you should not cross, and so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Alan. Paula, rebuttal. No, I'm fine. Thank you. All right, thank you. Our next question will come from Dine Dennis Wyman, and then Paul, you'll have the first response. After the death of George Floyd, there's been a call by some to defund the police. Where do you stand on that and why? And what police reforms, if any, do you support? Well, thank you. Um, I totally stand in support of our police 
and uh, defending our police. Um, we all know how important they are to us from our small communities to the, our larger communities. Um, there were, you know, what happened to George Floyd um, was horrible. You know, it, uh, his death was uh, broadcast across uh, videos, um, on the, whether it was the internet or the TVs um, around the world. And, you know, we can um, hear, you know, various reasons for what was done and why it was done, but yet um, that was not a good deal. And we definitely um, sympathize with a lot of those actions. But at the same time, we defend our police because those officers get put in some horrible situations. Um, they get the calls, they have to react. Um, and I mean, they're, they're well trained, but yet they have to just rely on that training because everything's happening at a, a fast pace. Now, what can we change? Uh, we did pass a, a police reform bill, which added some additional trainings and such, but we took the bill we passed came from the different law enforcement agencies. We need, whether it's, if it's law enforcement, if it's doctors, we want those professionals in whatever case we're working on for legislation to tell us what could help them. So in this case for police, it's, uh, you know, giving them the additional tools they feel is necessary. And we know that there's additional resources that they need. Um, to me, those are the two biggest things. Um, if it's training, they will tell us. You will come to our local agencies, our city and our counties. They will tell us what they need. And I believe they're doing an outstanding job. Um, in every time, every occupation, there might be a bad apple and we maybe saw some things that shouldn't have happened. But uh, um, I think we're going to, they're going to get better from going forward because of that. Thank you, Paul. Alan. Well, thank you for the question, Dennis. What happened to George Floyd is absolutely unforgivable. And um, I, 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 my family and I, when we first seen it, we were praying for, uh, for him and his family and um, everyone else across the state of Minnesota and our communities. Um, it was definitely um, an unfortunate moment in, in our nation's history and certainly in Minnesota. Um, do we need to hold those individuals accountable that were responsible for that? Yes, we need to hold individuals accountable. Um, Minnesota does, uh, there, there is some issues with racism that we have. Um, there are some things that we can improve upon. And I live my life by the golden rule, right? This is something I learned in, as a very young, young person, as a child, and something that was reinforced in the army is we treat others as we want to be treated. And so I think that's something that is really important when we take a look at um, how, how our interactions uh, are going um, out in the communities. Um, but I really believe that Minnesota has the opportunity to be great. We, uh, we can fix these issues. We can do it together. Uh, we can do it with our law enforcement partners. We can do it with the communities that are being affected by it. And that requires strong leadership. Um, I would also add that um, what is true in Minneapolis may not necessarily be true for greater Minnesota. We have some outstanding law enforcement officials, uh, cops, we've got great cops here in Minnesota. And one thing that I, I instituted were community wellness officers. Um, I'm not in favor of defunding the police. I don't think that's an accurate term. If anything, I would put more money into uh, policing to ensure we have community policing and to be able to provide them the tools and training necessary to be successful. Thank you, Alan. Paul, a rebuttal? Nope, I'm good. All right, thank you everybody. We'll move on to the next question. The next question will come from Matthew and then Alan, you'll have the first response. Uh, I wanted to talk about healthcare. Uh, many major healthcare decisions um, in the last decade or so have been made at the federal level, um, but I wanted to get um, uh, you your can uh, your views on what the state can do. What do you feel the state's role is in health insurance, and what is your platform when it comes to um, moving forward for better health insurance um, and health care for Minnesotans? Well, that's a great question. I am um, again circling back to the health care disparities that we have in Minnesota. 
you know, we need to make sure that um, every Minnesotan is providing quality is provided quality health care, and making sure that that insurance is affordable for them, making sure that that it is um, accessible to them. There, and if you were to look at Senate District Two in, in Greater Minnesota, uh, Matthew, uh, if you're up in Bodette, I was just up in Bodette there about a month ago, and if you want to have a baby. You got to go all the way to Bemidji. If you have a special needs child, like for example, where I live on the reservation, you have to drive a two hour round trip just to get special services, special therapy, um, just for just for that like occupational therapy, right? Um, we have an accessibility issue, a real huge accessibility issue in greater Minnesota. And the role of, of, of a senator is to make sure that we're advocating for those needs to be addressed. Uh, make sure that those communities that need health insurance, we're working towards trying to get them health insurance or pointing them to the right resources. Or for example, using local government aid uh, for like, for example, the Minoman healthcare facility. Um, Rod Skoy used to do that. Um, and when he was the senator here, uh, making sure that we're providing adequate and making sure that those facilities are accessible and open. Um, I, I think, again, I think there is a, uh, there might be a rural urban divide, um, especially when you try to get healthcare services, um, even, even dental work. It's some of these services that you gotta get for dental work, you gotta go all the way to Fargo. And so um, this is a huge issue that we need to work on. And it's something that I will make sure is a priority um, should, I be, should I be elected. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Paul, your answer. Okay, thank you. Um, what can be done about health insurance? We, you know, in four years, I think we moved the needle a fair amount. Is there more to be done? Yes, there is. We still have uh, an affordability and accessibility issue, but um, it's gotten better. Um, but, you know, I'll go back to, is it affordable for those in the higher end of the, uh, age spectrum, high 50s, low 60s before Medicare age, um, it's not affordable. And, you know, we've got more to do there. Where does that come from? Um, you know, when we were able to flatten the curve, so to speak, on the huge increases that were taking place back in uh, 15, 16, going into uh, 2017, um, we had to put some reassurance into the program for the insurance companies. And we called it a reinsurance uh, plan where the state stepped up. We, back when the ACA and MNsure came about, a program we called the Minnesota Comp Comprehensive Health Plan was discontinued. And that was the plan that uh, offered insurance for those with pre-existing conditions and uh, high users of the health care uh, field. When those people got put into the regular uh, system, it drove things sky high. And so there's where the reinsurance plan that came in has helped a bunch. Uh, we've also passed some PBM licensing reforms, uh, PBMs being the basically the, the middleman on our pharmaceutical drugs. Uh, the, the part that they don't manufacture anything, they don't distribute anything, and they don't retail anything, but yet they make a big difference in the cost of our pharmaceutical drugs. Um, so we've gotten into, we're starting to license them. That's just okay. early on. Thank you, Paul. Okay. We're, we're good. Thank you. Um, let's see, Alan, do you have a response? Yeah, just very quickly, I would say that uh, we need to take a stronger look at our, our prescription drug costs. I know the president has uh, has mentioned some of that that he's done recently. I think that we need to take a look at that in Minnesota. Um, you know, there's the insulin bill that was uh, that was addressed. Our elderly, uh, the cost for health care for our elders, that is just uh, unacceptable. We need to make sure that we're taking care of our elders and our seniors. And um, I would like to see more uh, assisted living facilities for our elders as far as health care goes. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Paul? Yeah, thanks. And I will just uh, add on a little bit there, the because I was just in the, talking about the PBMs and our pharmaceutical drugs. Um, that is a huge issue. Um, we've looked at some stuff. In fact, we held a meeting up in uh, Bemidji, I believe about a year ago, looking at um, 
our state's uh, consumers or patients being able to buy at what was considered or called, we labeled it the uh, Canadian drug pricing. Um, and it's the unfortunate thing, most of all of our drugs are, the research and development is done here in the United States, but yet they're all manufactured 80% plus overseas. And then you bring in the, the little thing about tort reform. We, we've got a lot of room to work on this. We need to bring it back to our country as far as manufacturing and our costs have got to get back into a line because if people are dying without the uh, availability of the drugs that they should have had, uh, that's not acceptable. All right, thank you, Paul. We'll move into one more question here that will come from Heidi and our first response will come from Paul. So as we speak here this evening, President Trump is hospitalized due to COVID-19, thought in part to be because of not wearing a mask and not social distancing, and some people in his orbit have also come down with it. In July, the governor of Minnesota mandated masks in all indoor businesses and public indoor spaces. What are you hearing from District 2 about masking, and do you wear a mask in public? Okay, um, what do I hear in District 2? We be in a rural district, um, there's a lot of opposition to the masks. It's the kind of thing, if a person's got a comfort level wearing one, um, fine, uh, not a problem. Um, but in some of these areas, should they be forced? I think that's uh, government overreach. Um, do I wear one? No, I don't like to. If I go to the doctor's office, I have to. But beyond that, um, I just don't go shopping and doing those things, which again, that goes back and hurts our local economy. It hurts our local businesses. Um, I think this has gone too far. I think we people have to take some of their own responsibilities. And again, if you've got um, health ailments or something where you are um, someone who should have concerns, um, you know, great, do it. But um, to have it across the board, and now we're seeing what's happening in our schools. Uh, we've got a lot of children not going to school, they're going to be there be homeschooled, virtual schooled, our school districts are losing out um, on their income. They set up their uh, uh, budget back on January or July 1, where they locked into all their teacher contracts. And now when I've had one school district that's up to 20% of their students didn't show up, they're going to be uh, educated at home, the school district loses out. And so this mass thing to me has gone too far. We need to bring some common sense and some reasonable uh, things back into it. Thank you, Paul. Alan. Well, I, again, I do wanna send my uh, thoughts and prayers to the president and his family and millions of other Americans that have been affected by this terrible virus. Um, certainly it's nothing that, um, that should be taken lightly. Um, Personally, I, I, I do wear my mask uh, as best as I can, whenever I can, wherever I can. Um, I do my best, you know. Um, I'm a moderate Democrat, probably more on the conservative side um, of that equation, a uh, little right of center. Um, but, you know, this is a curious, politi I don't know, curious politis politicization. It's, it's, it's a curious case of, of turning a mask into a political issue. Um, it's a health issue. And, and we need to make sure that we're protecting as many lives as we can. We know this virus goes after the elderly community. And I, I will say this, you know, for on the reservation and for other Senate District 2 folks that I've spoken to, a lot of these grandparents are the ones that are raising these children and they're sending the children to the schools. And um, if those children, they catch the virus, they have a high chance of recovery. But when it gets, when it touches the elderly, it, it does have a disproportionate effect on them. And so we do the best that we can to protect the children, to protect the families, to protect our schools. And, you know, certainly there's talks of a vaccine that's coming. And I, I, I certainly look forward to that so we can get back to full business. We need to, we need to make, make sure we're starting to reopen the state. We need to make sure that our personal freedoms are being protected. We need to do all of these things. And I think we can do it responsibly. I don't think it's a, it's, it should be either or, either or choice. I think we can do it re as responsible adults. Thank you, Alan. Paul, a rebuttal? 
just that yes, uh, we, we it needs to be a responsible response based on facts. Hopefully, um, I tell people all the time, a, a mixture of politics and healthcare is a toxic situation, and uh, we've got one going on right now that isn't uh, that great. I just wished we could stay focused on the healthcare, and people would appreciate that too to just get the facts, and uh, they're more apt to follow. Um, requirements or requests um, when it's based on some good solid data. So, but will we get there? Hopefully, but uh, I won't hold my breath. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Alan, a rebuttal? I just want to say that uh, for those folks that are watching at home, again, my thoughts and prayers are with you and uh, just be safe out there. We're, we're, you're important. Thank you. Thank you. We will move now into closing comments. So Alan, you'll open the closing comments. You'll have two minutes. Thank you. I, I, again, I wanna thank everyone for this opportunity to uh, uh, have this uh, debate uh, slash discussion with Senator Aki and for your news organization for hosting it. I know that a lot of folks that are watching at home have a lot of questions that they may need answered. Um, if that's the case, if you want to learn more about myself and my campaign, please visit my website at www.roy4sd2.com. You can simply Google my name at Alan Roy for State Senate. I'm also on Facebook where I post regular updates to make sure that you know what I'm doing, what I believe in, and what I stand for. My background in the military is, a, uh, is an asset to the state of Minnesota. I, I believe that we need strong leadership. We need strong military leadership at the state capitol. Um, again, I'm, while I am a, a moderate slash conservative Democrat, um, I do believe that we need to make sure that we're taking care of everyone in Minnesota. And if that means we need to start uh, fixing those uh, disparities that we're talking about, making sure that people are healthy and safe at home and making sure that our business community is being supported and taken care of, I will be that state Senator for you. And I will listen to everyone, regardless of the politics. You guys have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Paul, your closing comments. Thank you. And thank you to everyone involved here today. Um, during the past seven months, we have all spent a lot of time doing, the, doing business via these video conversations. And thanks for making this work for us. Um, we will have a challenging budget year ahead and I'm looking forward to the challenge. I'm confident that we can make lemonade out of lemons and produce a budget that is fair and balanced, um, good for all citizens of Minnesota. To serve the citizens of Senate District 2, it's been an honor and a privilege that I do not take for granted. I work every day to defend our freedoms, support our law enforcement, protect our most vulnerable, and much more. I would be honored to earn your vote again this year. Uh, please vote Paul Etke for Minnesota Senate. And you can go to my website, uh, pauletke.com for some additional information. And with that, I thank you for, for those of you that are on the uh, Zoom here this afternoon and to those that are watching, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. On behalf of all of us here at Lakeland PBS, I wanna thank our candidates, Senator Paul Utke and Leonard Allen Roy for joining us this evening and participating in debate 2020. This marked the second of 10 state legislative debates that will be featured this week here on Lakeland PBS. I hope you stay with us for our final debate tonight and join us again tomorrow and later this week to hear from other candidates in our coverage area. If you missed any portion of tonight's debate or if you would like to watch it again, It'll be available on the Lakeland PBS website in 24 hours. That website is lptv.org. Also, be sure to read a recap of tonight's debate in Wednesday's Bemidji Pioneer newspaper or online at BemidjiPioneer.com. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a great night.